the big British castle. It's time for Adam and Joe to broadcast on the radio. There'll be some music and some random talking in between. And then eventually the whole thing will just end. the beginning of the show black squadron don't want to miss a thing that's not the way black squadron rolls went to bed at a reasonable hour gonna be sharp on saturday morning that's the secret of the squadron's power good morning squadron stand to attention you're being addressed by camp commander dr buckles and Commander Cornballs. I, I just added uh, the... Um, Camp Commander. Camp Commander. Yeah, I'm like a kind of effeminate commander. We're going in at the deep end, straight in with Black Squadron at the top of the show. Yeah, I think it's good, you know, keep them on their toes. Go hardcore. Exactly. Uh, they, know, they know what to do, right, Black Squadron? Yes, Squadron, you have to listen to Commander Cornballs' command for you and then take a photograph of yourself enacting that command... And then send it in to the following email address. adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk And what do people do if they don't want to take part in the command and have opted out of Black Squadron There's, because they don't what? believe in squadrons? What? Well, There's there no people, vol volition here. Like pacifists, people who are maybe part of a ponstron. It's like conscription, you have to do it. Do you? Yeah. Flipping heck. What would happen if you refused to be conscripted when conscription was around the place? You'd be arrested, would you? You'd be arrested and thrown in prize on. Inter really? Into prize on, yes, <laughs> unless you had a jolly good reason for not wanting to what be What would be a jolly good reason? Well, in them days, if you were a homosexualist. Really? Or if you were mentally unstable. Right. Which is, which is, uh, fairly, both things are fairly common. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, both of those I would have gone for immediately <laughs> in them days. Yes. You, that, that, you, yeah, let's not get into that. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, the email address at adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk. Uh, here's the command. And we're being ruthless here. I rested the command on my electronic keyboard. Joe's going to be freestyling right the way through the show this week. Do a little freestyle <laughs> jingle. <laughs> Fingers Cornish. There you go. That's, That's a taste of things to come. <laughs> a frightening taste of things to come. Here is the Black Squadron command. Stand by. This week's command is fake facial hair. It's beer. With Venus is a boy. As featured in the film Leon, right? Leon the pig farmer. Yeah, Leon the pig farmer. Mm. Big West End uh, stage production now of that. That's a confusing link. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Even I was confused by <laughs> What are you talking about? Non-sequiturs. Uh, Leon, the film about the assassin man, you mean? Yes, starring Natalie Portable Man. Not And Leon then you the segued into Leon the pig farmer. Yeah, the yeah. 80s, 80s Brit, Brit film comedy. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, which is now on stage. Is it really? Yeah. So there we go. We oh, no, no. A private <sighs> function I'm thinking about. Another pig-based thing. Pig-based. That was a triple segue. Hey, listen, this is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Uh, happy Saturday morning. Thanks for listening. And thank you especially to the Black Squadron members who we pushed in at the deep end this morning, straight in there with a powerful command, a disguise-based command. It's very important as a squadron member yeah. that you're able to protect your identity very quickly. For instance, if you've done a killing. Uh -huh. and you need to blend into the crowd, uh, then you need to get some facial hair going quickly. Like um, the assassin man, Carlos the Jackal. Exactly. Yeah. And you need to be able to do it very quickly from whatever uh, condiments or accoutrements you find within arm's reach. Mm. So, you know, we hope you've reacted quickly to this command. So, wait, squadron, you, and many of you have. You're, um, right. Do you think any of Black Squadron have done a killing? Well, the, their future <laughs> orders might involve... You know, people. Not necessarily people. Is that a fun Saturday morning believe, thing? I can't believe you said that. <laughs> They're a squadron. What do squadrons do? Why I mean, do it's... always kill people? I'm not saying it's morally right, but sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. But they're a squadron for a radio programme. <laughs> yeah, but it's... It's not a game. Is it not? N no. I mean, I, listen, we established last week in the podcast that they are not a ponstron. I don't They're think the Black Squadron would be interested in being in Black Squadron if it wasn't a pretty hardcore uh, arrangement. So you think it's like being in the army? Like, uh, you can go in the army and you can learn it's all kinds of important skills. It's harder than being skills. in the army. It's tougher. Somewhere in the back of your mind, you have to be prepared to kill. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. What do you think's going on in the world? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't realise. Um, anyway, thank you for all your entries, Black Squadron. Uh, some brilliant responses. We'll be uh, being specific about that in a, in a moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Play another jingle on your guitar. On I your... <laughs> <laughs> guitar. 
it's not a guitar. What is it then? I can't really play anything on my... Listen, I'll work on something for later in the show, some live (laughs) jingles. Um, And talking of fake facial hair, we had the most wonderful photo in from a chap called Phil Graham, Mm. who has put this incredible hat on his child. Can you describe that, Adam? It is a woolen beanie hat that also has a beard attachment. So the the top of the beanie, you know, the the, the hat part is white and cream coloured, but then there's a there's a little uh, woolen beardy part, a that knitted comes down. beard, yeah, and it fits beautifully it's over like the child's face. Giant chin strap that goes all the way up the chin and all the way across the top lip, but it it transforms the child into Count Buckley almost <laughs> instant, instantaneously. Yeah, he looks like Captain Birdseye. What a fantastic thing. I wonder whether that's homemade or whether it's commercially available. Is that on our blog, James? We're going to put it on our blog. We might not be able to yeah. tell you precisely what the provenance of the hat is for BBC reasons. That's but brilliant. we'll put an image of it. Anyway, thank you very much, Phil Graham. That was uh, wonderful. We got a nice message this week. Um, it said, I was so excited when I heard that you guys were returning to our precious radio. This is the only radio show that I actually have a genuine interest in. It's hard to find one that's interesting but uncheesy at the same time. Never leave us again. Love, Amber. 12. <laughs> in Hemel Hempstead. It's got very good taste. Yeah. That's excellent. For a 12-year-old. I thought that was a very mature, intelligently written email there. Mm. And she says a smiley at the end. Oh, dear. Oh. Well, the smiley's more the sort of thing a 12-year-old would write. Well, it's nice. But uh, incidentally, you know, thanks for all your messages that come into us during the week. And what's the automatic reply that, that they get? It's something like, you know, we get a huge volume of emails. Well, that's new, isn't it? And we I can't was thinking that everyone. during the week because when I was a kid and I wrote into Blue Peter, yeah. I got a similar letter and I remember how heartbroken I was. Yes, it's a bit that impersonal, the, isn't it? That the Blue Peter presenters weren't reading the letters personally. Mm. And it was the first thing in the world that told me that, you know, it wasn't necessarily a one-to-one direct relationship with the Blue Peter team. But that's an automated reply that is fired out. We want to assure you that both Joe and myself do read every single message that we get and appreciate every single one of them. That's true, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. I mean, it really is. We spend most more of the week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we just plough through them. Right, now I've got a free play for you, listeners. And uh, me and Joe are allowed to bring in three songs a week that uh, we're, we're going to force on you. <laughs> we don't have to okay them with the Big British Castle as long as they're not really racist and full of swearing, then it's absolutely fine. So I'm going to play, I would say, quite a weird song right now hmm. by the band Deer Hoof. And um, this features the vocal stylings of uh, Satomi Matsuzaki. Now, we, have you played Deer Hoof before on the show? Yeah, a few, a yeah. couple of years back. And um, I really like Deer Hoof. I mean, they're a ridiculous sounding band. I've tried to ho- foist them on a few friends of mine without that much luck. It says on, on Wikipedia about uh, Satomi, the vocalist, although she had no musical experience, Deer Hoof founder members Rob Fisk and Greg Saunier agreed that Satomi's impressive, uh, sorry, inexpressive singing style added an element of humour and playfulness that had been lacking in Deer Hoof's sound. <laughs> um, anyway, see what you think. This is called Green Cosmos from 2005. Yeah, I mean, it's no, uh, just can't get enough though, is it? <laughs> That's Depeche Mode with John the Revelator. You can't really say things like that to Depeche Mode fans because they get very, very, very touchy, angry. very defensive. Yeah, they are the most loyal group. Uh, of fans in the world. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Do you think if you had a big rock, like instead of the Olympics, you had some sort of competition in which fans of bands were pitched against each Uh other in in physical and sporting challenges? I wouldn't like to go up against the... The mode. The moders. The the modulars, yeah. You think they'd be kings of the... They they do call themselves something. I think, is it moders or they call themselves something special? If you're a moder or a modulist or a... The moderators. (laughs) The moderators. They dress up in... Let us know what you're called. Yeah, in uniforms and moderate things. And they all talk like this. Um, actually, that's the Numenoids. No, the Numenoids talk like that. I don't know. Uh, the Numenoids, I wouldn't be frightened of the Numenoids. I'd be frightened of the, the Modulars. They're getting on a bit, the Numenoids. The AHA fans are quite militant. <laughs> You've as, experienced as their militancy. Out. <laughs> I very, very foolishly um, chose to take issue with AHA, the, the three members of AHA touring independently, but together under the same bill. If this like event did shows. happen, mm. this, big, um, this big fight... Yeah. Between all of the fans to see who was the best. Fan fight. Probably one of the younger bands with Teeny Bop um, f- fans would win, like Justin Bieber. Yes. Because the sheer weight of numbers and just the insanity right. of teenagers, young teenagers of that age, 
they would be like insane ants crawling all over you, you know? They'd easily overpower the, the moderators. They're a very frightening and force, the numenoids, little teenage girls. Aren't they? Sure. I mean, they're flighty. They might not be present six months later. They evaporate and dissipate. They'll move on to the next sexy little man. But when they're man. present, they're terrifying. Mm -hmm. Move on to the next sexy little man. Yes. <laughs> the next one that comes along. They're going to have to wait a while before they find another <laughs> sexy little man like Bieber, though, aren't they? <laughs> well, yeah, he's, he's one in the millions. He's one of the sexiest little men around. So listen, Black Squadron, well done. Have we stood them down yet? Not yet. Not I yet. Mean, Stand got, by they, to be stood they've down. They've got a few more minutes, I think, uh, to get their photos in. An extraordinary response. Let's S describe let's, um, some of the fake facial hair photos you have there, Dr. Cornish. Well, Dr. Marna Cornish, sorry, I'm Dr. Barnes. Yeah, please. There's a chap <laughs> called Edward Illes, L-L-E-S-I-L-E-S. -L -E -S. The printer doesn't distinguish between an L and an I. Mm, it's, just a, it's just a vertical line. And he's done the most brilliant thing, which is he's put a some sort of a shoelace around the top of his head, mm -hmm. and then he's hooked onto the shoelace a coat hanger. A big black plastic coat hanger. So that it hangs immediately beneath his nose. One of those big wide ones that you're supposed to use on nice jackets. Thus giving him an enormous uh, Thompson Twins style Well, he looks moustache. like a kind of crazy Freddie Mercury there, doesn't he? He's got, he's got the uh, Freddie Mercury But that's Mercury very practical. Handlebar. I mean, he did that fast. Very and nice. And it's very effective. Well done. Another one we like a lot came in from Claire, Ben, Mark, Tash and Joe. Do you want to describe that? Well, they look like an indie band. They're all sat there expressionless with their hands on their knees. Um, uh, let's see. Claire has tied some, what is it, pasta to her chin? <laughs> like strands of pasta. Um, and uh, Tash has tied her long hair round her face. Uh, around the bottom of her face there. Uh, one of the other ladies, I'm not sure uh, who is who, Joe, has got a waffle. <laughs> What's the general gym? mood of the photo? Because it's an interesting mood. Yeah, it's absolutely serious. And there's five of them in a row, shoulder to shoulder, <laughs> all with their hands on a table or their laps? On, on their knees. On their knees. Yeah. One of the chaps has and got a, very serious, a serious ball faces. of wool hung off his face. Yeah, I mean, it could be the cover of a brilliant indie album, or it could just be five members of an elite fighting force getting ready to go out. And as we've as we, as we established yes. already in the jeu, it's my new way of speaking. I like it. Um, they are getting ready to go out and kill. <laughs> hey, with, it's not necessary with waffles tied to their chins. <laughs> what are they going to do? Like smother you with a waffle and then stab you with the pasta? They might just be killing invasive insects, right? Household pests. Okay. All right. Well, that's still killing. Don't get too excited about the killing. Yeah, but you've got to differentiate. I mean, you didn't say that. Before, I mean, you're did angry you? about it, but you're also excited by it. Obviously, everyone. Dan from London was in the bath at the moment when the Black Squadron command was issued, so he's gone for a classic um, foamy beard. Very nice foamy beard. And he's got a very noble face, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, he, he's, he's a leader of men. He looks like a Roman um, centurion legion commander. When the bubbles in that beard pop, don't try leading nothing, because uh, it's going to be over. But while the beard's on, that's amazing, amazingly commanding man. He looks like a young Santa. He does. A beautiful young Santa in his uh, early 20s. Mm, before he developed that gut. What a, ti what a time that was When there were only a few presents in his sack. Uh, finally, Matthew and Kirsten. I think only Matthew is in the photo. He's already got facial hair. He's already got a beard. So what do you do in a situation like that? Hang things on it. Absolutely. Clothes pegs. Multiple clothes pegs. Attached to the beard, dangling off Matthew's face. That he's a leader of men as well. Mm -hmm. Like, if he stood up in a crowd, you'd do what that guy said, wouldn't you? Look, with those pegs yeah, he looks hanging little, off that beard. He looks a little <laughs> unsure. Also, there's what's he done on his fridge there? He's got a giant smiley face made out of magnets on his fridge there. It's not about the fridge. I'm just don't looking for the details. So, what, congratulations, Black Squadron. And don't forget, all those um, photos will be up on our blog. And the nice thing about the command this week is we can see all your faces. Mm. It's nice to see the faces of the listeners. Yeah, very good-looking group of um, squadron members as it's well. It's a sexy show with sexy listeners. Yeah, of all different kinds, multiracial, multi-ethnic. That's the same thing. What? <coughs> What am I talking about? I don't know. Okay, listen, I'm You're gonna obsessed I'm, with racism I'm gonna, and killing. Exactly. I'm gonna revamp my brain um <laughs> after the news, but first we have to stand down the squadron. Here's the jingle. Hey, Black Squadron Stand down, your work is done. You've earned yourself a nice warm bath. And maybe a nice little bun. It's ten thirty, time for the news here on BBC Six Music. What 
the Perkins. Oh dear. That's embarrassing. I mean, you would have thought they edited that bit out, wouldn't you? <laughs> I, you would have thought they edited that bit out. Yeah. That's a peculiar tense you said that. You would have in. thought that they would have edited that bit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was sloppy. Sorry, sloppy. That's quite an old record as well, so they've had plenty of time to but fix you know, it. If you have a big piano accident at the end of your recording session, <laughs> like root one uh <laughs> you know basic editing who are they anyway you cut what it was out that? right you uh, that was the small faces with their tiny ridiculous faces have and you, here comes the nice have you got my sandwich clips there james no oh we'll have to do that later well have you given james some sandwich clips yeah to keep his sandwiches fresh yeah that's a good idea Some sandwich clips that's what you know we haven't we'll have to do them later uh it's adam and joe on bbc six music uh, that's what I'm saying for the moment, just to fill in. You know, later on we're going to have some made-up jokes because we got loads this week. Mm. I mean, I've got now... It's getting out of hand, is what it Do is. Do you think so? A little bit, because the thing is that the quality... People still don't really understand the idea that they have to be properly made mm. up. So we're getting a lot of very basic puns coming in. And it just increases the volume of but mail. this is the thing. People think from. they've made up those basic puns. Yeah, but listen, what's the one that pops up most often uh, mascarpone comes up a lot mascarpone comes up a lot cheese-based joke uh a lot of cheese-based a lot of harry potter puns uh-huh. uh quidditch you know she hit that a, kind of thing jk rowling only gives her children a quid each i mean this has snowballed from a kind of uh, protoplasmic idea into uh, a huge thing in terms of quantity of stuff we're receiving mm-hmm. and we should really get professor brian cox or somebody can't we get Tim to brian? help us c- tim fine to help us collate the jokes yeah. and then we could issue some sort of national uh national joke status warning to basically have a moratorium yes. on certain areas of of humor so the nation knows that particular puns are taken care of mm-hmm. they don't need to be repeated yeah exactly like in denial yes the whole the, all the puns that come in about a being, river in africa yeah Mm. You can't do that anymore. We Stop could just it. nix a whole level of puns that are, that are too common. They're too widespread. All right, Richard Nixon. Hey, I'll tell you what. <laughs> shall we um, have the jingle even, made up jokes jingle, and then like tease the whole feature with a couple of little jokes, and then we can come back to it later on? Wow. A little, a little uh, joke tease? Yes. A little joke tease, mate. All right, mate. That'd be nice. Here's the jingle. I'm a funny person, I often make up jokes My jokes are more amusing than those of other folks When you hear my joke I think you'll find that you agree Come on, you're all invited to a made-up joke party I like that jingle because it's got an atmosphere of despondency to it Yeah, it's despondency in the face of hilarity Yeah Or the other way around Mm -hmm. Here's a joke that I made up Actually, it was a joint effort with Garth Jennings. Really? He he came up with it. Because I was thinking the jokes that I... My made-up jokes Mm. that I said in the first show after we came back, I I thought maybe they were so bad that I'd set the bar very low. Trained Mama from the throw. And released some sort of... um, (laughs) Yeah, released some sort of sediment from the bottom of the tank. Some joke stink. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I think that the made-up jokes we've had so far in the last Or maybe there were some listeners that were... Oh, oh, that's a... uh, Oh, I could do that! I could do better than that. Oh, if it's like that, I could do that. I did it with that. That's what happened. I thought it was funny jokes, but it's not. It's funny. Uh, I think that's what I did. I lowered thing. the bar so low that the bottom's fallen out of the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, you might think that that's. Um, Are you going to raise it lower? I don't know. What? Lower it higher? I might what? do a little lower raise. Here's one that Garth and myself came up with. Garth conceived this. I did a tweak on it. Wow. Have you Did heard? you get together just to do this? Yeah, we had a meeting. You had a meeting. Have you heard, in LA we had it, right. have you heard that Jonathan Ross's uncle was an East End villain who was notorious for pulling people's pants up to their ears? <laughs> he was called Wedgie Quay. <laughs> wow. It was very expensive to get out to LA for that meeting as the well. Pr- the problem, oh, his uncle. His uncle. Yeah, but so his surname isn't Ross. But you've unified the whole thing just by doing the weak R's on the... Exactly. On both yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was good. my idea. That That's was, very good. That was the extra uh, layer that I added. That, that was the extra layer? Yeah. What was it like without that layer? Originally, it was just about an East End villain who pulled people's pants up to their ears. He was called Wedgie Cray. And then I said, hey, 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 we I... are missing a whole layer here. <laughs> I think you've ruined it. <laughs> what? 
<laughs> I think it's better without the lair. I mean, it's very lazy to talk about Jonathan Ross's speech impediment, which is anyway not that pronounced. Uh, everyone does it. But I thought, I- I'll do that too. <laughs> See? <laughs> That's good. Is that it? Yes. That's very good. Thank you. And so what was your plan for this link? We were going to tease it with that joke and then do it properly. Yeah, well, you, have you got one? Well, just Not one that each. I've made up. Go on, then. It's one from a listener. Yeah. This, is, this is really good, though. And I did the Google test on this. Yeah. And it passed the Google test. It's from Henry St. Ledger, an illustrator and animator. So already I, I like him. Mm. Uh, here's his joke. Me and my friend John came up with this one. Patient. Vet. Vet. My parrots are stuck together. Vet. I'm sorry, I don't understand. It's too confusing. It's too confusing. Too confusing. It's too confusing. Two cans are fusing. That's quite good, isn't it? <laughs> and that's, I thought, well, surely that's been done before. Yeah. But I Googled it and no. That's brilliant. I Googled too confusing. You get a hey, hey, hey. Wow, that's the greatest accolade of all. Rather than a... <laughs> which I think Wedgie Quay got. All right, let's have, we'll have some more made-up jokes later on. Will we? I've only got one more. In the show. You can have some of mine. I have got right. them coming out of every orifice. Well, what's your quality control like? They're good. They're all good. Are Wedgie they? Quay is the worst Are of them. Are you sure? Yes, promise you. Villagers right now, and this is That Day. Meaning. Oh. Meaning. I like songs that end like that. With, it's a powerful out. Where all the instrumentation drops out and it's just the guy. Yeah. Don't understand me! When he, when he plays that live, it stops like that, and the audience don't applaud, they just think. That's right. For, for up to five minutes. They're Some of them silence. take out pads yeah. or laptops and work on their novels for a bit. No meaning! And he could extend the last line for ages. There's no meaning! Longer, longer. Did you ever do that, uh, that game where you try and make, sustain a noise for as long as possible? <laughs> I think we just did it. Yeah. Hey, listen, here's the thing. I was watching a film during the week yeah. uh, called The Ghost. The Ghost Writer, you know, with uh, Ewan McGregor. Sure. Playing the guy that ghost writes the Prime Minister, a thinly veiled Tony Blair. Kind of Roman character. Polanski. Yeah, directed by Polanski, starring um, Brosnan. Chris Bronholm. In a magnificent performance. As Tony Blur. As Tony Blur. But there was a weird thing about the film. They kept mentioning sandwiches. Did they? Yeah. Did we play the first clip? I don't... You know, I'm not sure this means anything. Uh, and I don't... I'm just getting it off my chest, really. But uh, it just seemed odd to me that they would mention sandwiches all the time. Here's mm. the first clip of sandwiches. You have six hours before Adam gets in from New York. Can you finish by then? I'll try. I'll ask Deb to bring you up a sandwich for lunch. Thanks. Perfectly innocent. Just bring you up a sandwich for lunch. Yeah, Fine. Everyone likes sandwiches. Uh, f- ten minutes later, th- this happens. How's it going? Pretty well. He keeps calling me man. He always does that when he can't remember someone's name. There are sandwiches in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and that stuck out to me. Oh, this is weird. What's the deal with sandwiches? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not as if it's set in, uh, in like an airport departure lounge where there are lots of sandwiches in the immediate environment. Well, it's a metaphorical motif that Polanski's Is it, though? And, and then later in the film, so you, get, you get this. Something to eat? What have you got? Club sandwich, ham charter. Chad will be fine. So he doesn't go for the sandwich, but it's the third mention of sandwiches in the film. Well, I think it is deliberate. So I was looking through the screenplay, mm-hmm. um, as you do, and then, and weirdly, the first mention of sandwiches is on page 17. The second is on page 27. The third is on page 47 of the <sighs> screenplay. And then later in the screenplay, there's a whole scene where the stage directions talk about sandwiches, even though they're not actually <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> This is your week. In the film. <laughs> your sandwich conspiracy You know theory. what? This wasn't just the week. This was last year. <laughs> and I made a note of this. Yeah. And then I've come back to it and I've recorded <laughs> all the mentions of sandwiches. <laughs> and now I'm playing them to the nation. <laughs> because I think this is the beginning of an amazing conspiracy theory. Do you? Uh, part of the plot of the film is that hidden <laughs> in the Prime Minister's memoirs is a secret code, right? Mm-hmm. That gives away some... That's the plot of the film, right? That gives away some misdeed he did. In his highly fictional illegal war. Right. And I think maybe there's a similar code hidden within the film based on sandwiches. Was there a code? I forgot about that part of the film. Yeah, I think so. I was focused on Ewan McGregor's um, accent skidding around all over. Yeah, there's lots of fun in that film. Lots of fun to be, inadvertent fun to be had. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But uh, what do you think about that? My sandwich conspiracy theory. It's uh, it's literally jaw-dropping. (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, but don't you think that maybe, maybe there's a chance that it is a metaphor? For, for what? Well, in the film, he is sandwiched between oh. the two powerful and opposing forces of Tony Blur or the Tony Blur character and the Cherie Blur character. Yes. And their um, independent agendas. Or it's set in a house uh, in New England, isn't it? On yeah. the coast. Of, maybe it's in Sandwich. Right. That's a place on the coast of, of America, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, it is. <laughs> anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. That's in, that's interesting. I wonder if people have got their own theories. Um, <coughs> about <laughs> conspiracy theories in other films that they've noticed, you know. It's unusual, though. Yeah. I mean, y y words are... You, you don't use just any old word whenever you want in, in a film. You if know, you're going to use word a word three times, mm. it's got to mean something. Sure. Like sandwich. Yes. Then it begins to stick out, certainly. Listen, let's leave that there. Ooh. And just like that song we just played. Yes. With a bit of meaningful silence. There's no meaning! And here's a free play. This is Talking Heads with Pulled Up. Metronomy with the look, with additional synth riffing from Fingers Cornish. That one's easy. It does that all the way through. Do you think Metronomy would have been pleased that uh, around Just about a minute something's... of their new single <laughs> was played over by Fingers Cornish on the synth? Eh? I think they'd be very excited and happy. Sure. And they're sure to re-release it with that in it, in it. On a B-side, sure, why not? What? That was good, I love that How song. patronising. A B-side? Yeah, all right. Condescending. Sorry. Turning it off, never doing that ever again. 12 inch then. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I really like that. First heard that last week and um, I like it like way more, 200% more this week. Wow. Imagine what it's going to be like next week. It's going to be off the hook. I might be over it by then. Mm. Um, I think it's time for Retro Text the Nation. Let's play the jingle. I like to listen to Adam and Joe. But I listen to the podcast, not the live show. I used to feel acute frustration. Because I couldn't join in with Text the Nation. But now my troubles have disappeared. Because Retro Text the Nation's here. And now my letter might be read out. Instead of thrown in the bin and forgotten about. Hmm, that's the anglicised version of that jingle with Bin. Mm -hmm. I think the original said trash, didn't it? And then we got complaints that it was Americanized. Yes. So we switched it to Bin, but then people who preferred trash got furious, and in the end we made one with both in. That's it, right. Yeah. It was a big war. There was a major war. It's full of conflict, the, the programme this morning. The Bin Trash War. But thank you to James Richards, the, the pianist who played the backing track for that, uh, did it very beautifully. Thanks a lot, James. Yeah, good one. We might be sending you a little parcel soon. Mmm, special signed Adam and Joe album. Mm. Ooh, worth a lot of money. He's waited a long time for it. So, last week on Text the Nation, we were talking about birthday flip-outs. And here are some of the messages that we've had during the week on the subject. Here's one from Anouk. And she says, Hello, Adam and Joe. I don't have many birthday memories, as I never really celebrated them. But there's one I still remember. It was my eighth birthday, and only two months before we'd moved from a big city to a tiny village. I didn't know anyone at my new school, so my father let me invite a bunch of kids over to the cinema and McDee's. What's this voice you're doing? This is Anouk's voice. OK. Do you think Anouk is a man or a lady? A lady. lady man. <clears throat> so this is how Anouk sounds. I think she's a serious person. First of all, the film I wanted to see was sold out. So we ended up seeing Richie Rich with Macaulay Culkin, who I thought was rather annoying. Then my school friends, in inverted commas, kept talking through all of the film and threw popcorn at each other and angered the other people in the room who did want to see the film. I felt embarrassed and left out, so I just tried to ignore them. Then we went to Mickey D's for Happy Meals, and it was the same. Loud shouting, throwing food and running around. I just ended up sitting at another table, alone with my father, looking at these kids I clearly didn't understand and had to spend at least another four years with at school. My dad just gave me a sympathetic look and said, Oh, well, we tried. We failed. Just stay at home next year, then? I've never had a birthday party since, but that's fine with me. Sounds like Lynch Poufar. Anouk. 
And Luke might be Lynch's uh, long lost daughter. I can sympathise with you. What a you. moving story. Yeah, it is moving though, isn't it? She can't relate to the other kids. And Luke's probably like a. I'd be interested to know what you do for a living, Anouk. I bet you're some kind of nuclear physicist or... Yes, something uh, very sophisticated. A geneticist. At a remove from everybody else. Mm. Or, you know, so just way ahead in whatever field she's currently operating in. Uh, you know, even if she's... Um, she's probably paid by a major conglomerate just to stay out of things. Mm -hmm. By the government just to just to keep out, keep out of things because she's too, the cutting edge is too yeah, cutting yeah because she can't she's too bright right if she works at Tesco's or whatever on the checkout uh, she she get make everyone fired because bad. her checkout st stylings are way in advance of anything that they can handle currently she can do f two full trolleys in under twenty seconds exactly and she's scanning things with her eyes and um, she can feel the barcodes just with her fingertips and things like that. Here's one from Jessie. On my 12th birthday, I had to accompany my elder sister to a sexual he health clinic. The woman at reception asked who wanted to be seen. I said, I'm 12. My sister went in to be seen. I didn't realise that she had told a rather loud nurse that it was my birthday and made the entire sexual health clinic waiting room <laughs> sing me happy birthday and try to hug me. Everyone thought I was a patient and looked sorry for me as I was alone. My sister turned out to be fine, but I'm still angry. <laughs> Is that a nice way to celebrate your birthday, to have everyone in the waiting room of a sexual health clinic <laughs> sing you happy birthday and try and hug you? Yeah. Thinking that you're a patient age 12. <laughs> a diseased happy birthday. Another quick one from Liz in Derby. On my sixth birthday, my parents had built me a throne by covering a large chair in tin foil so I could sit at the head of the table amongst my friends. But they made a fatal error of starting the happy birthday song when the lights were on. I tried to stop them, but everyone was singing by now, so the only thing I could do was rip up the throne to shreds like a demon. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> from dangerous Liz. as well, isn't it? Building Ripping up thrones. No, making a big um, foil throne like that. Why is that dangerous? Because you can be struck by lightning. Indoors? Yes, the lightning will go through and be conducted through the throne but imagine ripping up your throne in in a tantrum mm. that's the worst tantrum of all isn't it yeah especially after they spent all that time like constructing the yeah throne. well but done it is dangerous it's like it conducts Six. i heard of someone uh, there was a band or something who covered themselves with tin foil on stage and one of them nearly got fatally electrocuted yeah outdoors no in a venue really yeah by really? a cable lying around. Well, it conducts electricity. Exactly, that's my point. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> band tin foil. Here's one from Pete in Hersham in Surrey. Hi, Adam and Joe. I went to Chessington World of Adventures on my 11th birthday with a group of friends. We got to the front of the queue of my favourite ride, the Magic Carpet, and they had raised the minimum height threshold. Being the shortest of my group, I had to wait by the side with my mum. The tables have turned now, though, because I can still buy children's clothes without the VAT. I'm 25. Nice one. <laughs> I wonder what happened for them to raise the minimum height requirement. They saw him coming. Quick, it's Pete! Oh, no, you have to be a couple of inches taller, mate. Sorry oh, about Pete. that. Yeah, why? Do you think, like, someone nearly flew out of the... Yeah. ...thing? Yeah. Oh, that's no yeah. good, is it? So he's think, got to think himself lucky he wasn't the last guy on before they raised the height requirement. Oh, it's terrifying. We went... We went um, on some roller coasters recently mm. me and my family and my son frank wanted to go on but he's only just tall enough mm. to get on these things and i was so frightened he was just gonna fly out it really wasn't that much fun at all riding. it can be very scary mm. yes here's one from a household that sounds in insane mm -hmm. sam wistanoff this came from when i was around five or six my parents who disapproved of things like ice cream and jelly due to being hippies decided that all the food at my party should be healthy natural and brown right. so they called it the brown party <laughs> my friends were disappointed Is and the, the party party? wasn't going very well so to liven things up i stood on a chair and took my clothes off nice. i was carried away crying the brown party <laughs> that's a good party though isn't it the brown party and then you've got a little nude girl being carried away crying yeah it could be a boy we don't know sam yeah. winter winter you could uh, listeners please give us your gender yeah there's too many gender ambiguous names going around and do you want to hear a quite horrific one sure that involves shocking animal injury oh yeah love it. yeah love this it. is quite shocking is it yeah Try, well spin it to make it sound fun it's, it's because it's so fun and awful. Well, listen, maybe I'd better let James read it first. <laughs> I'm going to let James read it first. It is amazing, though. Here's a very short, sad one. Finally, Sophie Baker says, On my eighth birthday, we played hide-and-seek, and I hid behind the washing machine. I hid, so one, I hid so well 
that no one could find me and everyone went home. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> Wow, I like these listeners that just sort of remove themselves from everything. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Retro Text the Nation will be back next week, listeners. It's the way that you can join in with Text the Nation if you're listening to the show via the podcast or via Listen Again. Uh, so send in your entries during the week to our email address, adamandjoe.sixmusic at bbc.co.uk. And we'll have a delicious, fresh Text the Nation for you very soon. A giant, uh, fresh lump of Text the Nation coming your way. Squeeze now. This is Take Me, I'm Yours. The squeeze. Take me, I'm yours. This squeeze. is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music, and we're just going to pop back to retro text the nation for a little moment. It's been cleared. Where Joe cleared his horrific uh, animal um, injury story has yeah. been cleared by producer James. Here we go. And this was an email from. Uh oh, I don't think I've put the name down. Uh oh, uh oh. We'll have to come back to this another time and say the name. But here's the email. My brother was having his fifth birthday party at our house. My mum had recently totally redecorated. Ten very excited boys were herring around, and our Labrador Jimmy was really enjoying himself and joining in. Little do you got to imagine Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> the fun, the screaming, the, the excited cries of children having fun. To cut down on the mayhem, my mum put Jimmy in the garden, but he howled so much she let him in again. As he came in, the back door swung shut and clipped the tip of his tail clean off. Completely oblivious and happy to be back at the party, Jimmy ran round and round the house, wagging his tail vigorously, spraying blood all over the newly painted walls and party food, while the kids moved to the next level of hysteria. I'm 23 now, but the story of my 15th birthday has become a legend in my family and still makes me cringe. Oh, it's just revolting. That's horrific. Stumpy Jimmy, and he was okay, though. Jimmy's fine. Everybody involved in the story is fine, despite <laughs> its despite its grand guignol <laughs> trappings despite despite what is it we're saying despite <laughs> i can't say despite Hard, this morning you started yeah despite i managed to say grand guignol though is despite. that how you say that yeah that sounds good to me guignol guignol anyway we'll find out who sent that in and uh, and give you a name check and by the way the sam whose story i read out earlier is a man sam man sam thank you for letting us know that sam you're, uh, you're all man man i was in the um railway station earlier this week right have you you ever, spent most of your time in, in the railway station I love or it. on trains. I absolutely love it. Have you ever been to a railway station? A couple of times in the past, yeah. Yeah, they're brills. And uh, it was big uh, in the railway station. <laughs> That's it. Um, no, uh, <laughs> I was standing there waiting for my train and I saw a guy on the concourse drop uh, a twopenny piece on the floor, right? Just fell out of his pocket. So I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's two p. A two penny piece. Yeah, they're quite rare these days, aren't they? Are they? pieces. Yeah, no. you don't get them around so much. Take it from cornballs. <laughs> cornballs. <laughs> He's trying to have them phased out. A two penny piece. I'm trying to burn it. It already sounds archaic and medieval. A two penny piece. A two penny bit fell from his pocket onto yes. the concourse. Anyway, so I saw the two p fall on the. Is that more groovy? Yeah. Two p. So I saw 2P fall out of his pocket yeah. on the concourse, and I thought, I'm not going to tell him. I'm not going to bother to say. Excuse I mean, it's me, a lot of money. You dropped your 2P, because I thought he's going to look at me like, what? Oh, yeah, all right, thanks. Because it's just 2P. But then as I was thinking that, I was thinking, that's not the right attitude. We're in a financial crisis. You know, 2P, all the 2Ps count up. It's all about 2Ps at the end of the day, right? Yeah. So I thought... Um, yeah, I mean, what, what kind of attitude is that? Just to leave the... What kind of attitude what is kind that? What kind of attitude is that? <laughs> just to leave the toupee on the concourse. That's not right. So I thought, I'm going to pick it up. Because by that time, the guy had gone. But then I thought, I can't pick it up. Because someone might have seen me watching him drop it. And then if I pick it up, it's going to look like I was just waiting him for him to go away so I could pick up the toupee. <laughs> <laughs> steal it off him <laughs> thinking yes he's dropped 2p and he hasn't realized now it will be my 2p in my pocket for sweets or whatever <laughs> <laughs> this is like co-presenting a show with a tramp <laughs> if you were a vagrant <laughs> and you came in every saturday and told me the stories of your week <laughs> they'd be like this <laughs> <laughs> Coveting a tuppany piece. <laughs> so I saw it on the crowd. I was thinking, well, he doesn't want it. I'll have it. You could equally tell the same story about a third eaten burger in a bin. <laughs> yeah, but a, a real vagrant wouldn't worry about what people were thinking. 
You would make a good vagrant. That's the thing. That's the thing. I am. You've got the beard. I, I feel as if I have the soul of a vagrant, <laughs> but then also I have superficially, you know, a superficial level of respectability and, mm. you know, I'm integrated into society mm. in a superficially regular way. Like I have a family and stuff. Hey, like. we're all vagrants in a way. Well, exactly. You know, nothing against the vagrant community. No. But what, uh, yeah, it took me a so while. So what happened in the end? Did you get the tuppence piece? Yeah, I picked it up. I picked you picked it up. it up? You still got it? Or have you spent it? But, but I had to go through a little bit of theatre when I picked it up. Like looking around for the guy. Oh, he's gone. Oh, sir, your, your tuppence bit. I have it. <laughs> if anyone's, I tell you what, I'll go and announce it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Tuffany Bit has been found on the concourse a by a short bit. vagrant. <laughs> <laughs> if you've lost it, please come and collect it from the information. Uh, this, I think it uh, reflects well on you, though. You really, uh, you do it doesn't matter to you that it was just tuppence. It was still the man's property. It was the man's property. And, and you were still guilty about thieving it. Yeah. Yeah, that right. reflects well on you. Well done. Thanks very much. You're a, you're a tramp with a heart of gold. <laughs> Maybe if a woman kissed you, you'd turn into a log. <laughs> Not a frog. <laughs> a log. Here's Erland uh, and the Carnival. I've been really enjoying this album by this Ooh. band. I saw them supporting Wild Beasts. And, you know, that's some, sometimes the way you go along and see a band that you're really excited about. And the, and the support comes on. And they're really mm. good as well. That happened to me when I saw Willow Smith support Justin Bieber. Did you? No. Yeah. Oh. I was excited about that. This is Trouble in Mind. I like it. That's Erland and the Carnival with Trouble in Mind. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Uh, last week, I had the pleasure of watching a new documentary, music documentary, all about the Oxford music scene, which, of course, in the 90s spawned bands like Radiohead and Ride, Supergrass, Tallulah Gosh, Swerve Driver... You used to love Swerve Driver, Joe, didn't you? Not as much as I love Tallulah Gosh. Yeah. And um, the documentary is called Anyone Can Play Guitar by a chap called John Spira. And he has completed this documentary but not cleared the music yet, right? So it's not widely available. It's not going to be on TV until he does that or in theatres until he does that. And if you want, you can go and um, invest in this documentary at indiegogo.com. It's a funding site. You know those things where you can go and invest mm -hmm. in other people's projects? Anyway, if you type in anyone can play guitar into Indiegogo, you can contribute to the fund for the music clearances for this excellent documentary. But anyway, in the doc, right, you get to find out about all these bands who were in Oxford. And it was a real scene happening there. Um, and it was weird that, you know, you've got Radiohead coming out of there and then you've suddenly got Supergrass all within a few years. Uh, as well as Ride, you know, and all, and Swerve Drive were a big band as well. Tulu Gosh, immensely influential band. Um, but the story that really sticks out and is more or less the backbone of the whole documentary is the tragic story of the Candy Skins. There was this band called the Candy Skins who came out of Oxford and were, you know, really quite popular and uh, tremendous live and did fairly well actually you know it's not totally tragic because they did pretty well like compared to most bands they did way better than your average band um but they also had some spectacular little bits of misfortune check out this litany of ups and downs of the candy skins um first of all they had to rename their band they were originally called badlands but there was mm. another band in the u.s called badlands so they they got dropped from their uh, original deal as badlands and renamed themselves the candy skins uh, a legendary A&R man, Tom Zutout, he signed Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue, Joe. <gasps> uh, he dropped into one of the Candy Skins gigs and three songs in, he asks their manager how much money he wants for them. Signs them on the spot to Geffen for a three-album deal. Good one! Right? Amazing. So Geffen fly them out to the USA, give them the full limo treatment. Uh, out there, they're label mates and they play shows with Nirvana and Sonic Youth big wow. deal right at the time uh the u.s charts are um full of a lot of british bands like jesus jones and emf were in their kind of fun british poppy nonsense no disrespect <laughs> to emf or jesus jones so the first album the space i'm in by the candy skins is released out there but it was released on the same day as Nevermind by nirvana hmm. which kind of changed the face of um the u.s music industry and you know music across the world i suppose pretty much overnight suddenly no one really wanted to hear upbeat fun brit pop and it was all about grunge right anyway 
They've recorded their second album, Fun, The Candy Skins, in the US. Geffen decides not to release it in the UK because um, they're sort of thinking, oh, it's all about grunge now. I'm not sure about this uh, fun pop band. So Candy Skins are sent back to the UK to write their third album. Geffen then ignores them, won't take their calls. Candy Skins, bound by their contract, unable to record or perform live for about a year. Then they get dropped by their label. So it's all going wrong for them. Meanwhile, um, their roadie is called Ed Candy Skins, and he's got a band too. He's in a band called Radiohead. No. (laughs) Yeah. And they're doing really quite well. So the Candy Skins, who've just been dropped from their um, deal by Geffen, have to go and watch their roadie Ed conquer the world with Radiohead, whose song Creep is doing very well at the time. Uh, at this point, Candy Skins signed to a small UK label, Ultimate. Uh, they've got an album's worth of new material, release a bunch of singles. They start to chart. The momentum is building. Uh, they play Monday, Monday on TFI Friday, their single, which has gone top 40, the single. And it's the episode of TFI Friday after Chris Evans had just quit Radio 1. So the wow. ratings were off the scale. Massive viewing figures. So it's all going, well, you remember the song, Monday, Monday, right? Of course. Monday, Monday, I got egg on my face. Look at my face, it's a total disgrace. Tuesday morning, I got beans on my jeans. Is, is that not how it goes? That's not how it no. goes. But, um, so but it's all looking good for them, right? It's all looking so good. They're on the up again. Yeah, I mean, they had a tricky time. The label dropped them, but now they're bouncing back. It's all bouncing back. They're going to re- uh, re- release one more single from the album, and then the album's going to come out. Sunday Morning Fever, third album. It's Here all we go. going well, right? Meanwhile, Geffen. They notice that the band are doing quite well. So they think, hmm, I'll tell you what, this will be a good time to release that album Fun that we never released in the UK and stymie the release of their third album. So all that momentum is kind of dissipated and looks all a bit confused. Geffen released the album saying that it's the new Candy Skins album when in fact it was the previous one. And uh, so at this point, they, they prepare to release their new single, which is called Car Crash. We're going to play it shortly. Uh, unfortunately... About a week later, um, Princess Diana was killed in the car crash in Paris. Hmm. So the radio stations weren't keen on playing the new single, Hmm. understandably. Uh, The momentum at this point is now completely blown. So uh, meanwhile, their label Ultimate, they're having financial problems. Candy Skins go into the studio and produce themselves some tracks for their next album. One song called Feed It surfaces as a very strong single very contender strong. at this point walter yetnikoff like legendary uh, man from um, the 80s who ran sony he'd been responsible for michael jackson and bruce springsteen he signs them instantly on the strength of just wow. this one single and uh they, the band go back to the u.s they're touring they're promoting the single it's featured on the soundtrack of the water boy the adam Sandler wow. film doesn't get better than that at which point Walter Yetnikoff gets cancer and he closes the record company. Oh, no. Uh, so that's not good for Yetnikoff, his family, and um, and also the Candy Skins. Meanwhile, the head of their label in the UK, Ultimate, gets throat cancer. Uh, the label goes bust. And um, shortly after that, the Candy Skins split. Whoa. But, I mean, that's, that's a, a litany of um, woe, isn't it? And it's told, like, very movingly by the, the guys in the band in the documentary who are just the nicest guys you can imagine. And you sort of hope that maybe things will come together for them because they're still pretty young. They could reform and um, maybe there'd be another chapter in the, scan, in the Candy Skins, you know, story that would be a bit more upbeat. That's uh, what a what a story. That is a massive, uh, and it shows you that however talented or brilliant you are in terms of your output, there's all sorts of stuff you just can't predict or control in in the world. I once had a big argument uh, with somebody over: uh, Do you think that the most famous and successful artists in the world are the best? Are the best? Right? Is it kind of a meritocracy? Do you know what I mean? Do yeah. the best artists always rise to the top? Yeah. Or could there actually be better artists than? The super famous ones and who, what was who your... were just ignored. I was saying there probably are. Yeah, I agree. That it's not necessarily the, the absolute best artists become super famous. No, because you need luck. You do need luck. There's all sorts of stuff going on that's out of your control. Yeah. So there you go. The documentary is called Anyone Can Play Guitar, um, directed by John Spira, all about the Oxford music scene. And you can go and uh, help him complete it by um, seeking it out and investing online. Right now, here, here are the candy skins. And this is the, that single that they weren't allowed to play at the time, Car Crash.
That's the Candy Skins with Car Crash. Now, Adam, Cy Andrews has just emailed in asking for you to repeat the name of the documentary. It was called Anyone Can Play Guitar, directed by John Spira, and uh, you can invest on it online by going to indiegogo.com, as in indie music, and then gogo.com. OK, it is uh, 11.30, and it's time for the news. Starting right Beautiful. the way through that one. That's a that's a <laughs> <laughs> that's a cowbell sound. <laughs> is that a cowbell? Whereas this is a synth. Yeah, and this is an oboe. Oh, that's not bad. And this is the sound of someone <laughs> losing their mind. <laughs> that's a clarinet. <laughs> Synthesizers have come on since the days of the uh, Harvard stereo. <laughs> that's is what that I'm what? playing. Yeah. Hmm. Joe just found that in the hub. Mm. Has that been played by any big bands? Probably. Would the XX have used that? I their... think Metronomy did their whole album on it, didn't they? <laughs> this is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. That was, of course, PJ Harvey with Good Fortune. And I think it's time we launched this week's Text the Nation. Let's have a jingle. This was constructed by Jez Price. Uh, let's hear it. <laughs> That is good. That's very good. That's robotic, futuristic. I like it. Yeah. Do you think Jez's real name is Jeremy? And he gets his friend to call him Jez. <laughs> because it makes him a little bit cooler. Jeremiah? Because my name's Joe. Could I be the, the Jozza? The J-man Jozza? You wouldn't want to be the Jozza, though. Why not? Who wants to be the Jozza? It's just more exciting. You put Zs onto something, it's immediately more exciting. You used, used to be called Ads. Ads? Ads with a Z. Ads, ads is cool. Ads, ads. bads. What about Joz? Joz is not cool. Joz sounds rubbish. Sorry, man. But there's you've got loads of good names. That's true. I've got too many names already. Jay Corn. Jezza. Well done, Jess Price. That was amazing. <laughs> Joz. I, n- I, don't, I don't ever want you to call you Joz. You're made out. You've been made angry by that. I'm not angry. I just don't want to call you Joz. You are. You're not a Joz. So listen, what's the, uh, what's the text the nation? Joz stick. Tell, tell, <laughs> t- tell Jozzle what the t- text the nation is. Jozzles. Well... I want to talk this week, ladies and gentlemen, and I want you to interact with us about arguments that you've witnessed um, between couples, maybe, between friends, but you're in the room and you see the argument kicking off. Tricky situation. Mm. You're with a couple of friends and they start argumentalising. You know, it happens, obviously, with with, uh, married couples and couples that are together in a relationship after a few years. They get comfortable with each other and they start getting to that phase where they can freely argue become overly conversationally relaxed yeah and once you've got friends who've been married for a few years the incidence of these little disagreements increases part of the fun but it's part of the fun and usually (laughs) it's you know i'm not talking about horrible horrible violent arguments and stuff i'm talking about fun arguments just little disagreements hopefully it's not the early stages of the couple actually splitting up yeah but sometimes it is and what do you do in those situations Like, what do you do, Joe, if someone starts arguing in front... Because both you and I, I would say, are not that good with confrontation, right? Um, We both tend to get quite physically violent quite fast. (laughs) (laughs) We take it onto a physical level. But no, you have a good thing that you used to do when we were with groups of friends and there'd be an argument, and you used to just pipe up, Oh, Mum, Dad, stop arguing! As if you were a child, yeah. and the two arguing people were your parents. That's right. Mummy, Daddy, please don't fight! That, that's a good line, and it immediately introduces a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of fun into the equation. Yes. Uh, a guy I used to work with, Johnny, used to say that when, when but he was But you know what? Yeah. That was when we were younglings. Yeah. Uh, now we, you know, you are a, a mummy and right. a daddy. Now I'm dealing with real mummies and daddies. So, so what are you going to do about that? What do you do now? Just tell us it. your story. You encountered an, an argument. Well, there was a mummy and daddy staying with us the other the other day, round at our place, and uh, we were all having a nice afternoon. Sat around the table after lunch, a couple of glasses of wine, and dangerous um, territory already. Uh, I'll call this couple um, Tommy and Tina. Yes, and Tina 
<laughs> uh, suddenly piped up. We were talking about things like watching um, box sets. I was complaining about the fact that I'd run out of good. Terrific convo. It's a great convo. Great convo. Of Some of the Sunday ones. mags do columns on that. You could ref- make reference to <laughs> one knew, of those. <laughs> I knew you would pour What's a little scorn new? bucket on my <laughs> box set combo. <laughs> great combo. <laughs> Cornish gets out his scorn bucket, <laughs> fills the scorn bucket to the brim. There is a column in a paper that goes, my, what's well, called my favourite new box set or something. Is there? Yeah. I don't read that column. I'll cut it out for you. I just have the conversation for real. Okay. So we're having the, com- the box set convo, and it's going fine. You know, we've had the Lady Gaga convo, and um, <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we do the box set convo, and then Tina pipes up, hey, you know a great show that I've just got into that I was really quite surprised by, but it's brilliant, really well made, brilliantly acted, and really surprising. Great stories every week. Every Watchdog. Week. No, Jonathan Creek. Right. So she goes, Jonathan Creek. And what was the other guy's name uh, I said? Tommy and Tommy. Tina. Right. So Tommy goes, what? Jonathan Creek? Are you joking? Oh, bad start, Tommy. Too, uh, too much, too strong. Yeah, and he's genuinely outraged, but he's also embarrassed because he thinks that Tina's, you know, perfectly understandable love of a, a program that many people She's enjoy. lowered their cultural stock. Yeah, he is embarrassed that she likes Jonathan Creek. Right. It's totally unfair, incidentally. I've never seen The Creek, but I imagine it's brilliant and it's very popular. And she's announced it in front of Buckles and, and Lady, Bu- Lady Buckley's. Yeah. He thinks we're going to draw some kind of conclusion about her just because she <laughs> loves Alan Davis and, and his... You've known Tommy and sleuthing. Tina for years, though. Yeah. <laughs> and I could see, I knew that Tommy was really embarrassed about the fact. And he was like, and he had his head in his hands and he was going, Oh, Jonathan Creek, what? When do you watch it? You don't really like it. And she's like, Yes, it's really good. It's great. You're a snob. So I'm, not, oh. I'm not a snob. It's just, Oh, you, oh, Jonathan Creek. Oh. So it sounds like this accelerated very quickly, very sudden. Yeah, and then everyone went quiet because it was clear that he was genuinely distressed. Were the, ch- were the children around the table? No, they were all... Um, They'd gone off to play. ...hurting each other outside, yeah. And he, it, everyone, it got a little uncomfortable because clearly he was genuinely embarrassed and angry with her for <laughs> revealing this. <laughs> she was like, what? What's the problem? She's quite nice about it. She didn't get too chippy, but after a while she did. She started sort of saying, oh, why don't you just leave me alone and stuff like that? So, um... I think I tried the Mummy Daddy Please Don't Fight. It didn't work. It didn't really work. It was still a little uncomfortable. So how were you feeling during all of this? Well, I was chuckling a little bit. <laughs> I was having a bit of a chuckle. But then I also, you know, you also... What was your beautiful wife doing? Maybe clearing the table, busying herself, pretending to ignore it? Yeah, I think so. Dealing with mm. the dishes, mm. fussing, fussing in the <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> she was reading Grazia. Yeah. Right. And, um. <laughs> so, wow. So, so the text the nation subject is how do you handle, like, stories about arguments I'm that interested you found in, yourself in the middle right, of? Right. I'm interested in the arguments. I'm also interested in the techniques for dealing with them, maybe, like, uh, you know, yeah. conflict resolution, perhaps. The text number is 64046. The email is adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk. And, you know, Sunday afternoons after lunch with a bit of wine, that's perfect argument territory. Yeah. A lot of listeners, you can look forward to maybe having an argument tomorrow afternoon. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had, as I mentioned... Maybe the- plan it. Maybe plan the very provocative... And it should be about something very trivial. Jonathan mm-hmm. Creek's perfect. Yeah. Because it's totally innocuous. Yeah. What does it matter? So it's the perfect subject to have a huge destructive barney about yeah because we as i said we'd already exhausted lady gaga right and it was all about like the 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 merit of lady gaga i was defending gaga but that got very heated let's not get into gaga no all right then uh here is death cab for cutie this is you are a tourist i'd like a death cab please for the cutie you're a tourist that song was called this is adam and joe here on bbc six music don't forget listeners that this amazing radio show will have all the flab removed from it and be reduced to a two minute long podcast uh available tomorrow no it won't be two minutes it'll be they usually around about an hour and we have extra little nuggets in there for you as well lots of um podcast exclusive content so check it out and that'll be available tomorrow evening probably tonight probably tonight gets faster and faster whoa uh, you know, available from the usual podcast outlets. Also, we have a blog, 
Tell them about the blog, Joe. The blog's extraordinary. It's going to have all your Black Squadron photos on. It's currently got all of last week's Black Squadron photos. So if you want to see what listeners to this, other listeners to this show look like, Mm -hmm. what kind of things they get up to, and especially what kind of stuff they have in their houses. There's also a video on there, I think, that we've uploaded of someone actually having a birthday flip out, aged six, when he was doing a bit of musical chairs. You get to see him dancing around the chairs there. There's Ghostbusters playing in the background. It's all very authentic. Someone beats him to the chair and he goes completely mental. Lots of stuff to check out at bbc.co.uk forward slash blogs forward slash Adam and Joe. Uh, it's free play time now. Some, uh, one or two people have asked what a free play is. People keep asking us that. Should we keep telling them? Well, the, the music that you hear on this show is put together. It's a combination of stuff that our producer James chooses. Some of it is playlisted by the station. Some of it's uh, ordered by the state. Some of it is government ordered. sanctioned. That's, that's right. David music. Cameron pops in and he says... I think you should play a lot more Death Cab for Cutie because mm. they're so so good, and lots of <laughs> lots of Scar. Play a load of Scar because I think Scar's absolutely great and really fun. Are his sleeves rolled up when he says this? Yeah, yeah, because he's he's he means business. Sure he does. Sure he does. Comes and that's in a sign his, of meaning his business. Tie is rakishly askew. I have more confidence in a politician who has their sleeves rolled up, don't you? Yeah, because they they they're ready to get their hands dirty. Yeah, they could deliver a calf at the drop of a hat. <laughs> uh, so here's a bit more Raphael Sadiq. I played a track from his new album Stone Roll in a couple of weeks ago. This is the last one I'm going to play, but this is great. This is kind of a tribute to Leon Ware. Do you know who Leon Ware is? No. No? no. Oh, he's the chap. He's a kind of soul singer and, and artist and composer. And he, rec- he wrote all the songs that became I Want You, the Marvin Gaye album. Oh. So he's like a classic 70s uh, soul guy. He's still recording, I think, Leon Ware. This is Raphael Sadiq's tribute to him. This is called Moving Down the Line. Go on. Go on, fingers. Wait, wait. <laughs> that is the sound of Joe Kornschmidt, the fifth member of Power Plant. You go crazy with it now. That is too crazy, pull it back. Mm, the rest of the guys in the band have noticed you have too much funky in your fingers. Schweinhund! So you're out of the power plant. Nein! That was craft work there with uh, Computer Love. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Now, here's a clip from last week's show of me talking about a video I'd seen online of the Kings of Leon. Uh, we played one of their tracks, and this is what I said afterwards. There's a weird video of them on YouTube playing at Reading a few years back, where apparently they just hacked off, they're having a bad gig, and they just play like an incredibly bad version of one of their songs deliberately, and just sort of playing weird notes all over the place and singing out of tune. That's cool. At first I watched it, and I couldn't figure out if someone had dubbed over it to make it sound deliberately bad, or if it was them just being weird themselves is quite perplexing so i never actually said last week whether i had decided all i said was that i was a little bit confused i think you were suckered hook line and sinker i was by les mitchell's son that's right well there was an avalanche of communication saying buxton you idiot hole it's a shred video and of course i've seen shredding videos before the first time i was aware of them was um a few years back when there was a chap called santeri ojala also calling himself St. Sanders, who did some amazing videos of people like Stevie Vai and, like, guitar virtuosos, and he would deliberately, de- you know, he would dub well, now, deliberately... Now you're just showing off your knowledge of shred videos well, I, I wanted to, to make try it... and get a little bit of um, yeah. stuff in the bank. Yes, of course. <laughs> a bit I, of padding I, I had you seen for them when before. you take a punch. I'm trying to set up the fact that I was... So how come you fell for this one? Because it's amazingly well done. But anyway, to explain the, the shredding thing, it's people dubbing deliberately bad versions uh, musical versions of songs that are being played live in a in a video right and so this kings of leon one i saw but i was confused because the sound like the the the, the guy's voice is exactly like the lead singer here's a clip of the the shredded version of this kings of leon performance playing sex on fire But you realise that that probably is him singing. No, it's not him singing. This is all 
Are you sure? Constructed, yeah. Are you sh- are you sure? Listen. No, but it could be they played the shredded stuff in a different key. You never know. Are you 100% sure? Yes. Now I am. Hope I'm not putting my foot in it again. That is not the lead singer of the Kings of Leon. If he'd knocked all the accompaniment out of key, it would make all his singing that previously sounded in key out of key. It's just a theory. I think it could be a real stem of the real singer, but he's knocked all the backing stuff out of key. No, I don't think so. I think uh, it's completely constructed from scratch. The guy can tell me. Anyway, his dad, Les Mitchell, as you said... Uh, he was one of the people that emailed. He said, Hi, Adam and Joe. I was listening to your program on Saturday. Had to laugh when you spoke about Kings of Leon being hacked off at the Reading Festival and playing badly. The playing was all done by my son, Tom Mitchell, 24. He's a creative sound engineer from Perth, Scotland. He does shred videos where he dubs over funny versions of live performances of various bands. Check them out. Uh, he's done Coldplay, Sigur Ross, Radiohead. There's a very funny Radiohead one. Uh, Fallout Boy, Mars Volta. I can assure you my son does all the instruments and records it on his Mac computer. Check out his site on YouTube. Uh, he calls himself Allergo Noise on YouTube. And um, they're amazing. And I think he does the singing as well. Uh, I might be wrong, but Les or... Um, Tom, you could get in touch and let us know if you do the vocals. But that's the thing that fooled me on the Kings of Leon one, was the vocal. I just thought, well, that is just the guy from Kings of Leon. And then I went online and I searched for a review of that Reading gig and I found out that the reviews were all quite mixed as well. They were sort of saying they played a weird show and they left the stage early and they were obviously having a bad time and they got a bit angry with the crowd for not being enthusiastic enough. So it all kind of made sense. I thought, wow, this is a real performance of them throwing this gig. But it wasn't. I was suckered in by a brilliant bit of uh, shredding there. What's his name, Tom? Tom Mitchell. Tom, you fool Count Buckley's. Enough respect. Which is very, very, very difficult to do. <laughs> very difficult. Very difficult. <laughs> I've so seldom been fooled by anything. And usually all my facts are absolutely on the money about almost everything I talk about. I'm one of the most <laughs> well-informed men on the radio. <laughs> anyway, check out Tom Mitchell. His stuff We is could have a new sort of segment, like Fool Count Buckley's. Yeah. I sent, incidentally, name drop um, for you, Tom. I sent your Radiohead shredding video to uh, the members of the band, and they thought it was very funny indeed wow um anyway here is desmond decker right now this is israelites i'm a funny person i often make up jokes my jokes are more amusing than those of other folks when you hear my joke i think you'll find that you agree come on you're all invited to a made-up joke party Yes, it's time for a few more made-up jokes here on the programme. Just to remind you, these have been specially authored by Ha Ha Architects who have sent them in and they believe them to be their own work exclusively. You can't just nick someone else's joke and pass it off as your own. And also, you can't do like a really obvious one that obviously other people would have made. We gave some examples earlier in the show. Anything to do with denial and um, various Harry Potter-based jokes. Mask, mask, a pony. mask a pony. I'm worried about made-up jokes. Are you? I think they're taking over. I think they're like one of those uh, vines or trees that Tim people vine. complain about. <laughs> it's like the tin vine. It's growing all over the house and we can't see out the windows anymore. It's running rampant. It's coming indoors. I love made-up jokes. It's my favourite. We should just rename this show Made Up Jokes. Do you think? Made Up Jokes with Adam and Joe. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one from Joe. Uh, hey, Jim Morrison. I've got a fine selection of cheeses here. Which ones would you like? Camembert, Brie, White, Cheshire. I thought we weren't going to do cheese ones. That's the only one. Well, I didn't even understand that. Camembert, Brie, White, Cheshire. Because that's an unusually creative cheese one. I don't understand it at all. Camembert, Brie, White, Cheshire. Oh, I see, I see, I see. The types of cheeses. No, that's pretty good. And Jim Morrison is singing. That's pretty edgy. Come on, baby, light my fire. Camembert, Brie, White, (laughs) Cheshire. (laughs) No, that's good. I take it all back. That's good. That's very convoluted. Thank you, Joe. It's all right. Um, no, I'm talking about the author. Have you got one there? I do. Now, this one isn't... This is one you've given to me. Yeah. You're having to f- fuel my made-up joke pyre. And it's not very clearly laid out. I'm not <laughs> sure how to stretch, how to deliver this. It's from Stuart in Bristol. Uh, the, the punchline is the heading. 
Uh, dear Adam and Joe, did you know that it's Rick... Rick oh, I'm going to start again. Dear Adam and Joe, did you know that it's Rick Astley's wife's birthday tomorrow? I wonder if she's going to get him that Pixar DVD he keeps asking for. No, I wonder if she's going to get that Pixar DVD she keeps asking for. I'm making a right pig's ear of this, aren't I? And at the end he says, I would say not. Somehow, I doubt it. Right. And the, uh, email, the joke is headed, never going to give you up. That's my heading that I put for my own. Oh, you read it properly then. <laughs> <laughs> she wants the Pixar. She wants up. You get it. The but people Rick Astley, everybody get it. We've given you the ingredients. He's saying, I'm never going to give yeah, yeah, you yeah. up. It's like one of those magazines where you cars. collect the parts. I'm never going to give you Finding Nemo either. There you go. There you go. <laughs> You've thought about it. I just got handed it to me. <laughs> oh. I'm never going to give you Monsters, Inc. I'm never going <laughs> to. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Here's one from steve moore i walked past a hairy footed little man yesterday who was going to throw bread at me i said don't frodo <laughs> yes <laughs> don't th frodo that's good that's don't good. throw dough don't frodo you, don't you th give me the really bad ones yeah i did <laughs> <laughs> graham and Tariq. Uh, <laughs> you've put these big headings at the top well don't read the headings to remind me you're gonna me. tell me that this morning the strangest thing happened <laughs> i got out of bed i'm not laughing at the joke i got out of bed and started walking around the flat making small one. talk with various pieces of furniture turns out on my alarm i'd pressed the schmooze button schmoozing the furniture <laughs> He pressed the schmooze button. It's good, it's good, it's He's good. making small talk. Kiss hug, kiss hug from Graham and Tariq. Thanks, guys. Tariq. Um, here's one from Matt Hodson. What does Popeye have for breakfast? Egg, 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 egg. <laughs> James liked that one. Of course he did. Because <laughs> it's very good. Do you think that's made up? Egg, 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 egg. Do you think that's made up? Sure it is. Have you tested it? Egg, 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 egg. Put in egg, 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 egg on the computer <laughs> then, if you want. <laughs> Won't work. <laughs> Have you got one more? No. Now you do. <laughs> oh, <No>, God. <laughs> <laughs> There's my emergency page. <laughs> Which one? Anyone you want. Anyone. <laughs> I do like your headings. <laughs> That's to remind me what they are. It's very effective. Okay, did you hear that the Japanese government has decided to recall... Oh, I'm sorry, I picked this one. Did you hear that the Japanese government has decided to recall all its foreign troops and no. replace them with cardboard cutouts? No, I didn't know that. They're calling it the Orig Army. Bye-bye, Cheesecake Bobby. Kiss, 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 kiss. The Orig Army. That's good! It's good. I mean, this is an extra layer now to made-up jokes because they're going through Joe's joke filter as well because he's reading out ones that I've picked. Nice. Oh, you mean they're not going through my filter? Well, no, I mean, you are adding a layer of filtrosity, filtrism, you know, critical... Oh, right, yes. Uh, here's one more from me. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Written by you or chosen? Chosen by me. From the stinky this bag. This is um, from Matt Horner in Auckland in New Zealand. So I should... Actually, you should read it out in your New Zealand Mate, accent. I do a very good New Zealand oh, accent. Mate. And the thing about it is it's totally distinct from my Australian accent. Because <laughs> it's more I've, sibilant. No, I've worked out exactly what the difference is. Hobbits. And there's a little bit at the top there where he's just explaining about the Hobbits. creation of the joke. And then Hobbits. the bit in italics is the joke. Do you understand the system? Yes. Right. Uh, dear Adam and Joe, I have a joke which I made up during dinner with some friends some seven years ago. Hobbits. Hobbits. As you can imagine, my joke was widely well received. So I spent the next seven years refining the joke to, to a point I was truly happy with it. Enjoy. Hobbits. Colon. Hobbits. Pop in your hobbit house. <laughs> Customer. Waiter. Waiter. Could I have some more of these small, sweet-tasting onions? Waiter. Sorry, sir. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's shallot. I mean, yes! we've, we've had that before. Have we? I mean, that's one of the classics. Not with that brilliant setup, though. I, I felt like I was in the restaurant. I'm going to get some small, <laughs> <laughs> get some sm small sweet tasting onions. No, says the waiter. That's shallot. Thank you. Matt Horner, Auckland, New Zealand. Hobbits. Hobbits. <laughs> All right, then.
I thought they were good. No, Thank that you was to good. Everyone. They were very good. Thank you to everyone who sent us sent those made in. up jokes. Remember, the more tortured they are, the better. Yeah, I guess. Because then that makes them more authentic. I know. I, I, I lean too heavily on the puns. All right. Here's a free play for you now, listeners. This is one of my favorite ever bands. And this is from their album that was released in 2001, Girls Can Tell. This is Spoon with the fitted shirt. Well, that's very good. Uh, Danger Mouse, Daniel Luppy or Loopy? How would you say it, Jane? Loopy. And Jack White, of course. Um, but do they not have a name collectively, or are they just called Jack White, Danger Mouse, and Daniel Loopy? That's not a very good name for a band, though, is it? He's got a lot of names already, though, hasn't he, Jack White? Yeah. A lot of different outfits going on. He's got loads. I mean, he's He got doesn't want to overburden good. people, so yeah. he's just going by the... He's doing the utilitarian thing. Right. And I guess, I mean, they're all big names, aren't they? I mean, I haven't heard of Daniel Loopy before, to be honest, but... Maybe they all want to stand out as individuals. Maybe, maybe. But then there's a fourth guy on the picture. What, what's he playing? <laughs> His name doesn't get mentioned. Who's he? It's very confusing. That'll never be a success. Tommy Knockers. Uh, that's from their forthcoming album, Rome, which oh, is out... If it's Tommy Knockers, maybe it will be a success. On the 16th of May. I'm not sure it's Tommy... It's one of the Tommy Knockers. It looks like Tommy Knockers. Yeah. I watched the Tommy Knockers the other day. It was on the TV. The Stephen King film. Yeah. Is that the one in the plane? No. No, that is the Langoliers. What happens in the Tommyknockers? They're alien men and they come and they take over the minds of people okay. in the village. It's not about a man called Tommy who grows knockers. <laughs> I wish it was. Let's have the Text the Nation jingle. Text the Nation. Text, text, text. Text the Nation. What if I don't want to? Text the Nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. So Text the Nation this week, listeners, is all about arguments you've found yourself in the midst of. Like if you're at a social engagement or out in the world and suddenly you find the people you're with or people close to you having a huge Barney. Mm. How do you deal with it? Here's one from Dan Baker in Walthamstow. He says, whenever I'm at a dinner party or social situation, if it gets a bit heated after an argument or discussion, which happens a lot as we're all film nerds, I wait for a beat of awkward silence, then I play the opening to Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On. This diffuses any situation and results in either hilarious laughter or confused looks. Uh, and either results in stopping the argument or uh, a return to normal civility. Hmm. You wait till you're married, it won't work then. Well, he shares this method with his fiancée, Sarah, and his friend, Dave Simpson. His fiancée? It might work on your fiancée. Once you've been married for ten years, then you try singing Let's Get It On during an argument. He doesn't sing it, he puts it on. Oh, just he, to completely alter the mood. He sticks it on. Is that a good tactic? I mean, what, what record could you have put on during Tommy and Tina's altercation? Um, Maybe the theme from Jonathan Creek. Yeah. <laughs> what is the theme from Jonathan Creek? So based on a farm, I think. Um <laughs> Jonathan Creek. Jonathan Creek. What Here's one like from Amy, it? who's a girl. Amy girl. <laughs> and she's in the pacifist black squadron. Oh yes. No killings. No for... killings. Good. Yeah. Uh, my parents are starting to go deaf, so sometimes when they argue these days, they have to ask me what the other person said. I use this opportuni opportunity to rephrase their insults in a friendly way, and it yes. seems to work. That's pretty good, isn't it? She's the Kofi Annan. There's hope the... for the future. Eventually, the arguing individuals will start going deaf. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What did you say? But then what if you get a rotten mediator? Right. Who wants to stoke the fires? Mm. That'd be bad. What was her name again? Amy. Amy Girl. Amy Girl. Yeah. Well, Amy girl, I wish you'd come around to our house. I've got the same sort of problem with my parents. Um, and here's another one. This is from somebody anonymous. Once, when I was about eight or nine, my parents were arguing in the lounge. So I took the keys to my dad's Ford Granada, got in and started the engine. My parents came running out, stopped arguing with each other and yelled at me instead. Successful conflict resolution. Nice. So that's a way if... if I mean, you would, wouldn't want to encourage that for children. You don't want to... Go starting cars, <laughs> obviously. That would be a very bad thing for the castle to encourage. Yeah. But in this one isolated incident in the past where no one can be harmed, mm. that was wicked. A very good tactic. Don't you think? Yeah, that's excellent. Here's another one, finally, for this little segment. Larry from Didcot, who is a male. This is very good, people telling us their gender. Larry Mann. We like to know where we stand. Yeah. Uh, this it, could, it should be like they, they do in Iceland. You know, you're either um, Stevenson right. or Goodman's daughter. Right. 
you know, so we'll just... Dotir. 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 That's fun. Good man, son. Or dotir. Well, why don't we do it with that? Good man, son. This may not be... What do you mean, why don't we do it with that? What's his name? His name is Larry from Didcot, brackets So you mail. call him Larison. Larison. And if it's a girl, you call them um, Tina Dotir. Dotir. <laughs> I like that. I prefer the Dotir. Dotir. This may not be a completely relevant example, as I did not know the couple in question. In a popular supermarket, I witnessed a couple attempting to choose a loaf of bread on the appropriate aisle. The woman was dithering, overcome possibly by the large number of brands on offer. This led to the brilliant comment from the man, Oh, come on, love, it's not rocket surgery. <laughs> 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 that's a that's a bit of a what do we call them malapropism as well yeah you know what did we used to do those on this show do you remember in the past mm. people who've got things confused oh egg corns yeah that's a bit of an egg corn as well a little bit there we go so let us know about your um argument handling tactics don't forget to tell us if you're a brother or a daughter 64046 is the text number the email is adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk now here is um karen and Dottir. And this is called My Name is Trouble. That's not true, though, because we've established her name is Karen Ann. So I don't know what she's talking about. This is the opening track from her latest album, 101, out on the 4th of April back then. Oh, good times. Tour dates will be announced soon. I've finished reading out all the things on my fact sheet now. Well done. <laughs> That's New Order with Blue Monday. I don't need to tell you that, though, right? Yeah. No. Come on, guys. Cool. So earlier this week, I was in a um, public lavatory where I spend a lot of my time. And I was just finishing a number one when I fumbled my smartphone, which I was sort of holding in my teeth. I think I was gripping it between my teeth, ill-advised. Splash. In it goes. At the end of the uh, number two execution. Number one execution. That makes a big difference in the story. <laughs> because I plunged my hand in immediately and rescued the popular brand of smartphone um, from the wee wee pool. And, uh, An urinal? Yeah. No, it wasn't an urinal. It was sploshed right in the uh, bowl there. Right. And it was fine. That's a relief. Yeah. But man... I just thought, oh, this is this is not good. And what, you know, and there was a split second where I thought, hmm, I mean, it's probably dead now, isn't it? In the wee-wee pond. Probably just leave it there. But then I thought, no, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you, popular brand of smartphone. And I plunged my hand in there and ripped it out and shook it vigorously. Spraying. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Spraying wee everywhere. And that must have felt quite an adv like quite an adventure. It was, man. It was like a sort of... It's like the modern equivalent of one of those um, knight's tales. I mean, I know this is reinforcing now the image of me as a kind of... <laughs> Forage through <tram. laughs> toilet bowls, <laughs> picking up coppers on station platforms. <laughs> I'm, like the, I'm like a tramp with a life... It's good. ...of a successful man. It's good. ...with the trappings of success, but I'm actually a tramp. Um, but it worked, man. Yeah. It was amazing. What an amazing feeling. And it reminded me of a time when I was when I was little and I'd got my parents had given me a colour TV for my birthday. I must have wow. been about twelve or something. Wow. And it was amazing. It was a little Sony Trinitron and uh it was just extraordinary. I was sat there one Friday night and I was watching our Vida Zane pet, uh, followed by Magnum PI and I had a box of French fancies and I was digging in there and stuffing them in my little What are French face. fancies? You don't know they're the little square cakes, the pink and oh. the yellow oh, yeah, and I the know. brown ones. And they've got a they got a dollop of um and little stripes on them. Icing and yeah, delicious. Yeah. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, delicious. Yeah, that was delicious. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> playing through the French fancies. Um but I've got a glass of water on the top of the telly. Reach for the glass of water, knock it over, falls down the back of the Trinitron, and there's an actual fizz and a no. puff of smoke, and the screen goes dark. And that's it for the Trinitron. And I can't begin to explain to you the feeling of pure heartbreak and loss. I mean, because when you're that, when you're 12 and you're completely materialistically minded, it's like losing, you know, a loved one to see something like that happen. 
your beautiful, amazing present that you never, ever thought you were going to get off your parents. You know, the last thing in the world I thought they were going to buy me was a telly after all the times they'd come in and say, you watching telly? Turn that off. Do something proper. Read a book. Do you remember when I borrowed your video camera? And I tried in a in a in a speedboat yeah. in Greece, and I wanted to do a sh- like a Superman flying sure. just over the tips Same. of the waves yeah. shot. Yeah. So I held it very close to the surface of the seawater yeah. while the speedboat was speeding along, and it got splooshed, didn't it? It did get splooshed, and the seawater got in it, didn't it? And it stopped working. And it stopped working because water. If you spill water on something, you're fine. And on, like on a keyboard, because you usually you just dry it out. And as I found, and it evaporates. You're right. <laughs> and urine, 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 but not seawater. No, no, no. That yeah. has a salty sediment once it evaporates. That, that gets that into corrodes. the circuits. And the circuits, yeah. 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 But my Trinitron survived. No. Yeah, I came... Well, le- that's le- what I mean. If it's just water, mm. you're, the advice is just to um, obviously unplug, very dangerous, sure. but then just let it dry out naturally and it'll usually be okay. Yeah. Coca-Cola, I spilt a whole glass of Coke over a keyboard at work once. Oh. Broken. Didn't like it. No, too sugary too for crows. Too sugary for crows and keyboards. Mm. Just, just for you and your dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is handy, isn't it? This advice. Yeah, this is good this advice. This is good advice. You're fine with wee wee. You're fine with water. Yes. But uh, avoid seawater and sugary drink pop. Yeah, when it comes to dunking electronic devices into and, liquid and pop, <laughs> <laughs> and, and actual pop as well. Um, Great. Good. That's informative. Good. 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 But the feeling when the Trinitron came back because I sort of forlornly sort of switched it on the next day mm. you know going up to the corpse of my beloved best friend who had departed the day before did you clean the phone oh uh, w- with the phone um mm. i mean you might have wanted to wash it with with fresh water no i wiped it you know i, you wi- wiped I, I, it. I shook it off i mean i have to is it still a little bit stinky the yeah. phone it reeks <laughs> <laughs> That must be fun to make call, make and receive calls on. <laughs> and the guy the that phone with the phone that rings. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the Beastie Boys with Make Some Noise. That was Make Some Noise by the Beastie Boys. Which rhymes it's uh from their forthcoming album hot sauce committee part two out on the 2nd of may and that track is out digitally this week uh and physically ooh, that's a relief on the 16th of may um and apparently it's got a great new video with lots of famous people in it are you saying joe something like that it's all over the internet i haven't looked at it yet but it's got famous people like famous uh reconstruct yeah they're justin better, collins they're better than you sure um alan carr larry turner yeah larry turner she's they couldn't there. get turner they couldn't get turner no she's too busy too busy um listen it's time for a final visit to the land of uh text the nation let's have a jingle james text the nation text 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 the nation what if i don't want to text the nation but i'm using email is that a problem it doesn't matter text and Text the Nation this week is all about being in the middle of arguments that are nothing to do with you, but yet you're kind of trapped in there and, and tactics for defusing them. Here is one from Tom Garrison. Arguments, colon. I'm a big proponent of the, whoa, man, guys, guys. technique. Like, whoa, guys, it's only a muffin. <laughs> or whatever trivial thing the couple happen to be arguing about. This isn't muffin specific. The problems are if they don't think it's so trivial and argue with your patronising ways, or the whole argument made you feel uncomfortable or awkward so your attempt at perspective makes it sound like you fear the end of the world if they don't stop. That said, it usually works showing them how silly it all is. Mm. Hey, hey, guys, hey. guys, guys, hey, guys, come on, chill out. That doesn't work on Dr Buckles. Doesn't it? No, because when I hear people doing that voice, I think, what? Why are you why are you doing the calm down voice? It's diminishing the I'm argument. I'm not calm. Why are you doing the calm down voice? What would you what would that have done if you'd done that during Tommy and Tina's big argument? Hey, hey, guys. Yeah, because then you you make it into I think it fans the flames. It's exactly. like blowing gently on a it's, on it's a like fire. It's like saying, "Whoa, there's a conflict. You're embarrassing yourselves." Hey, whoa, calm down. What? Yeah. Jonathan Creek. You're exacerbating. You're it. insane. Hey, Cornbot and Buckzilla. A good technique when you are at a couple's house and they argue is to call the house phone from your mobile and mute the call. Do this a few times and the couple unite over bloody prank callers. <laughs> Works most times. That's crafty from Shane Greville. 
What? Man dangle. Oh, yeah. He's a man. I'm not reading that. <laughs> Shane Grevelson. Uh, yeah, Shane, he's a man. He's a man's man. Uh, but that's a good technique to call <laughs> man the house phone during the argument to distract them. Is it? Because, yeah. Well, then you feel you're being stalked by a terrifying phone freak. Yeah, but it distracts them. <laughs> so it's all right. It's better than them hurting each other. I suppose. Finally. Is this finally? Uh, no, semi-finally. Uh, my couple group of friends once squeezed down the front of a daft punk gig. Everyone was packed in and hot, and personal space was restricted to between your ears. A very good friend of mine was and con continues to be in a volatile relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I like friends who continue to be in volatile relationships. <laughs> they found it the ideal opportunity to have a stand-up row, finger-pointing and screaming the works. Whoa. It felt rather surreal as I couldn't hear a word over the music, and as I danced to robot rock, I watched the crowd manage to create a six-foot clear no-go zone around them, and despite the lack of room, uh, I got them a turbo shandy each to distract them, and they're still together. Ah, oh, good job. That's a good play. Like, if you choose your location properly, you can argue as much as you want. A, da a daft punk gig. Also, couples who... It's and perfect. It, yeah, couples who are able to vocalise in that way. For some couples, it's the hallmark of their relationship. And it's a, a, But it's a healthy thing sometimes. Yeah. There's a great Jonathan Richmond song called Couples Must Fight. Yes. All about, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of blowing off steam and it keeps mm -hmm. the relationship lively. The, 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 the bad thing is to have simmering resentment and contempt. You don't want that. Don't want simmering resentment, really? No, you don't want it to simmer. How That's... long can something simmer before it comes to the boil or, bo or boils away? Well, this is the thing. I mean, it could be, it could be a few months. stuff simmering for 20 or 30 years. That's not good. <laughs> You've got to let that stuff out. <laughs> oh, it'll be, it'll be done soon. <laughs> it'll be delicious. Here, finally, is one from Rob, who is a male of Norwich. Robson. Hello, Joe, and hello, Adam. Hello. I saw a tramp in Tesco. Arguing with the self-service checkout lady voice. Wait, was this me? He then fell over and clunked his head on the screen. Oh. Argument solved. He lost. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that was me. Could have been you. I've got a lot to say about those self-checkout machines. They're, yeah, do you like them? Pro? Well, we should save it for another day, really, because we're running out of time. But there's a lot to be said about those things. Mm. Uh, that's Text the Nation for this week, listeners. Thank you to everyone who contributed. Don't forget, you can still contribute if you're listening to this via Listen Again or via the podcast. Send your contribution to adamandjoe.sixmusic at bbc.co.uk. And who knows, it could appear in Retro Text the Nation next week. What an incredible reward that would be. That would be amazing. M imagine. Imagine. Imagine giving that gift to a little child. Oh. <laughs> what, I did. It was beautiful. That's what the child would say. It's amazing. Here is this is your free play, right, Joe? Is it the Human League? Yeah, this is a bit of Human League, and this is such you a. Say you, you say the Human League. I say the Human League. The Human League. Yeah. Yeah, and this is just uh, this is like a chewy sweet. This record. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was a if it was a sweet, it would be a chewy or a fruitella. Not a mojo. It's just com complete sugar and riffage and squidginess. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fascination by the Human League. The Human League with Fascination. That's it for this week. Uh, you've been listening to Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Thank you for listening and thanks to everyone who's uh, texted or emailed during the show. Please keep your missives coming in during the week. Don't uh, forget to download the podcast this evening. It'll be ready for you to download. Oh, my goodness. And um, we have a Twitter account now as well, at BBC Adam and Joe. Are the capitals important there? Um, yeah, at BBC Adam A N D Joe, and when people tweet on this account, it'll be clear if it's James, our producer, or maybe Lucy, our broadcast assistant, uh, and then I suppose occasionally it might be myself or Joe. Although what we're about, not going to. Uh, what about Twit Squadron? Twit Squadron. I what mean, about... the show already has an army of uh, of, of Twitter followers mm -hmm. who Twitter one another during the program. Right. They call themselves Twit Squadron. Right. What about them? What Have about you thought them? of them? Yeah, but they can join in with this one, can't can they? Can they, though? Yeah, well, they can read them. Yes, they can! <laughs> <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Hooray! Whew. And uh, Joe and I were just talking about the fact that, you know, anything that we can think of that's tweetable, we usually save for the actual show. So we're not going to pretend that we're going to be on there the whole time. But I'm really going to do my best to try and think of a few tweets that I can plop out there during the week. That sounds exciting. Tweet plops. The way you've described it. <laughs> Uh, Liz Kershaw's coming up in a few minutes and we'll be back next week at the same time live here on Six Music from 10am 
to 1 p.m. next Saturday. Hope your week goes really well. I'm going to Centre Parks this week with the family. Oh, no way. Back to Centre Parks, Exciting. mate. Exciting. I'm very excited. My body's looking great. I can't wait to get into the Biodome swimming pool and show off my physique. Are you there all week? Get in there. We're pretty much, yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> You're lucky. Wow. Oh, I'm a lucky guy. Um, so I can't wait for that. And I'll it's going to be in. fun stories next week. Yeah, sure. Who knows what you'll find in the bins? Who knows? All kinds of stuff. <laughs> and in the pool as well. Good times. Uh, thanks for listening. Take care. I love you. Bye. Bye.